So, you say, where are you at right now? I'm in Minnesota right now. I'm waiting for my buddy to fly in from uh, Florida. He's stuck in Texas. He missed his connecting flight, and then they had thunderstorms. And we're going to hunt Minnesota and Iowa, hop around a little bit, yeah. if he ever shows up. <laughs> <laughs> I've been sitting here in this parking lot since last night. Seriously? Well, I did, yeah, well, I did go ride around this morning and listen for goblins. And I uh, heard about five of them, I guess, different spots. So we got some targets to go after. Nice. I think this is officially the first year of my life where I've made it this long and not heard a uh, actual gobble. So is it that's starting a little to green? depressing. Is it starting to green up out there in Colorado? Yeah, it is. Uh, I was just noticing the tree outside's got some green leaves on it. The grass is real green, and it rained yesterday a lot like more than i typically see because i'm usually not around this time of the year but it yeah was you're raining. on the turkey tour <laughs> yeah typically Usually. but i was uh yeah i was enjoying listening to the rain actually last night that was kind of cool and it not actually just being snow is nice yeah. too so it's crazy i there. mean it's it's green up here grass is green and we've had days of 80s you know close to 90 and then it got cool again. And I just drove down the road when I was listening to gobblers this morning. In the, the ditches, there's still snow in the ditches. And I'm like, how does that not melted by now? Yeah, it's but, crazy. Yeah, up in the mountains, I can still see it looks like there's quite a bit of snow. But, like, my dad went hunting last weekend, and he was just, it was snowing on him. I think the first day it was snowing, and then the next day it was just crystal clear. But, you know, you got all that fresh snow. It's pretty funny he saw gobbler tracks and strut marks in the snow which is just not typical for for me not the type of hunting i want to be doing but yeah that's that's me this year for some reason you know i I typically don't have a problem going hunting in cold and snow i you know went and hunted that one year with my recurve it was like eight degrees or 10 degrees or something um but this year we had such a long cold winter in minnesota in minnesota it started snowing in november and the snow didn't melt until earlier this month. And I was so sick of it that I had a chance to go out to Nebraska to hunt and I stayed home. Mm -hmm. I was like, I I, I was like, I had a coworker wanted to go on vacation. I said, man, go on vacation. I'm gonna stay around here and work. I am not going out there turkey hunting in cold snow. I've dealt with it long enough. I just, uh, I'm not gonna have any fun. (laughs) And if I'm not having fun, I'm not gonna go out there. I saw you posted something about that somewhere and I was like, yeah, I can. I can understand it's like when you want to go turkey hunting, it's like you want to be in that nice weather and spring. Yeah, like today. Like today, yeah. it's like seven, 60 degrees, 65 degrees, sunny, just the Perfect. slightest breeze. You know, things are starting to bud out. My ideal turkey hunting day. Yeah. Yeah, I like that mid 60 to upper 60s temperature. Seems like it's about perfect as long as, you know, as long as you don't have wind or anything too. Oh, yeah. Extreme. So I guess today I don't really know all the things that I want to talk about, but I guess the thing that I definitely feel a lot of times when I'm hunting is I start thinking about real specific things when I'm actually out hunting. Like you start noticing a trend or something maybe that you're doing this year that you weren't doing last year, something you switched up. And I guess to start, is there anything – since you've been hunting that pops into your mind that's something that stands out that you've been thinking about a lot or trying to pay extra attention to or anything in particular no i'm 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 basically hunting the way i've always hunted i'm going out there trying to roost birds in the evening i'm trying to locate them in the morning i'm just you know moving in to get close to them and setting up um i have hunted a lot less this year and I, I can't go into a whole lot of details about why, but I, I've got a side project I'm working on, so it's eating up a lot of my time and money. Mm-hmm. And so um, I've only hunted six days this season. Normally I'm at like 20 days by now or more. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've I've been very fortunate. I think I've hunted a total, um, well, up until the last two days that I hunted, prior to that I'd hunted a total of nine days or nine hours and killed we killed five, four gobblers. So even on the days that I've hunted, I've only been out there for a couple hours each day. So I haven't, I feel like I haven't hunted at all is what it feels like. 
but I've just That's been very fortunate this year. So not a whole lot of changes, just being very lucky and the birds are coming in and working to the call pretty good. That's pretty sweet. I feel like uh, some years are just like that and then others aren't, but it's nice when you get that little that little run where things are falling in your favor consistently. Yeah, I, I hope it's not changing for the bad because I hunted – day five and six and i put on almost 20 miles or just over 20 miles of hiking and we were hearing birds but as soon as they hit the ground they disappeared and we hiked and hiked and you know just trying to blind call here and there and strike a bird and they just wouldn't talk and after two days of doing all that hiking my legs gave out i was like i don't know i don't know what's up with these birds but i'm hoping it's going to change today and tomorrow and the next day while we're hunting here in the midwest something that uh i think about a lot and i feel like we've talked about before and i think that i probably heard you say on some of your turkey calling videos is you have a lot of tutorials about calling but you have uh at least in the past talked about your opinion of all those extra little calls aren't necessarily the important ones what calls are the ones that are important to you that you feel like as somebody that's getting into turkey calling or you know wanting to improve their calling what should they focus on and what should they maybe put on the back burner until they figure those things out yeah if someone asked me what what calls would i you know if i had to only choose a couple it would be a yelp and cutting cutting really does wonders i mean and and a jake yelp would be a close third you know or second or whatever um you know obviously you want to yelp to the birds but cutting a lot of time i've had so much success with cutting and I like aggressive cutting like just <laughs> throw some yelps in there and string it out on you know a uh, long series of calling or cutting even if he's gobbling just keep cutting on top of him and especially if i can get working with a hand doing that i've had so many birds that were you know off in the distance that would come in quickly when me and another hand would get to working and then like i said the j kelp man that thing there's bailed me out of uh, many situations where gobblers with hens or just gobblers that are hung up and then you throw in some j kelps especially if i hear a jake with the gobblers then i ignore the gobblers i start concentrating on the jakes and j kelp to them just like if i hear hens with the gobblers i ignore the gobblers start concentrating on the hens because the gobblers are going to follow the, that other bird, you know. And so if you can convince them to come in, you'll drag them with you, uh, with them a lot of times. I like the uh, yelping and cutting as well. I feel that there's a lot of things that I do when I practice all the time, like purring and clucking and, you know, some of those more subtle calls. But I know it was you that said to me or on a video one time, like all those things are – things that turkeys are doing in close proximity to each other if he's already there hopefully i've shot him at that point yeah, yeah. so <laughs> but i really like that and that's really stuck with me and i feel the same way as far as when my calling i feel like got better i was just incorporating a lot more cutting into it and i'm constantly trying to get better at you know faster cutting or whatever to keep a turkey fired up it seems like when you find that lone turkey and you just hit him hard and you can really get him gobbling and just almost just shut up and let him come in looking that's when i've had the best luck calling and it, yeah. it seems simple but you know you kind of have to have that confidence in the field to let that rip i think yeah and um uh, back to what you were saying about the soft talk soft talk is good especially if you're in tight with a bird you know the clucking and purring i think we've discussed this before if you just need the bird to move a few yards out but from behind cover or step a couple yards closer. But for the most part, I wouldn't be so concerned with getting that down to sounding, you know, like a real turkey. I would concentrate on your other calls, the more important calls I would consider yelping and cutting, um, those sort of things. Um, because like you said, and I think I, like I've said, if they get to the point where they're hearing that soft st stuff, the clucks and purrs, I should be shooting them. Unless there's something <laughs> of, obstructing them. Um, but yeah, the um, when you get ex excited calling to a gobbler and then you just shut up, you, no, there's no standard rules with turkey hunting. You don't necessarily want to just shut up and not 
say another word. You still got to fill him out and see what he's doing. You may have to throw a soft yelp there just to redirect him. Like uh, Minnesota last year, we had a bird that was coming in hot and heavy. And my intention was not to call him more, just let him finish coming in and, and look for us. But as fast as he was coming down that hill, I thought he was going to blow right by. So I had to throw a quick yelp in there to stop him and redirect him my way. So you still got to, you know, survey the situation and make, you know, decisions in the, in that moment. Um, but if you can be quiet after getting him wrapped up, a lot of times just put your gun up on your knee, be ready. Don't have it in a relaxed position because the next thing you know, he pops out from behind a tree at 30 yards and you're caught off guard. So be in a position to shoot while you wait. I like that tip. I think that those little things are things that as you make mistakes, you start to realize, hey, I probably better get my gun up and be ready because I remember that last time he gave me one of these and I was, you know, head up off the gun and that's, you know, not probably going to work most times. So, yep. Yeah, I like quick, that. Quick draw. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is never, you know, that's usually when it's like, boom, shot behind him or, <laughs> yeah. ooh, he flew away before he actually got down on the right. gun. So yep. I think I think that's a good tip, just being ready. Even if you can't hear anything or he hasn't gobbled, I think that's especially the time that you want to be ready because he could pop up and be in a direction where, you know, if you're down on your gun, you may not have to do much, even though he may not give you much time before he tries to get out. Yeah, and, and sometimes I've had it almost cost me before where I knew there was a bird within 100 yards of me, and he was gobbling his head off, and then he went quiet, and so I assumed he was coming in. And I put my gun up on my knee, and I was right down the barrel. Basically, all I needed to do was close my eye and look through the red dot or something. And I sat there for 30 minutes straight, just like that. And you're talking about, you know, things starting to ache. Yeah. And I finally said, okay, a crow flew over ah, 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 real loud. He didn't gobble. I said, okay, he's not in the area. I, I lowered my gun and started messing with the camera. And then, and like, moments later, I hear... And I'm like, oh, gosh, he's right here. And I had to, you know, get my gun up without him seeing. Thankfully, he stepped behind some brush where I could get my gun up. And and uh, I ended up shooting him, shooting him. But it just goes to show that, I mean, you're sitting there and you do what you thought was right. <laughs> and and it still almost cost me not getting a shot because I didn't give it, you know, another couple more minutes, maybe. Mm -hmm. you, they're so unpredictable sometimes. Yeah, for sure. I think one question that came up from uh you talking about mimicking the other turkeys that he's with because i just told somebody the other day my opinion on the matter but i'd be curious if you have a different opinion so i was having a conversation about getting the hen fired up it's like a very common thing you hear um with turkey talk it's like well if he's with a hen you try to make her mad, piss her off or whatever, and she's going to come in. But that's generally where the conversation ends. It's like, oh, yeah, we'll just do that. And I, I guess I think in the perfect world, yes, if you can get her fired up and you can start communicating back with her and bring her to you, that's ultimately going to be, you know, what is going to pull him in. Because otherwise, if he's with her, he's probably not just going to leave her to come to you. Yeah, yeah. What's your opinion, though, like, I guess specifically in that situation, if she is not showing any interest in you, is there a way that you can change that? Because I've been in some situations where it doesn't matter what I do. If I'm calling to her, you know, trying to sound like a Jake, trying to sound like a Tom, you got a hen or two feeding, and he's strutting, and it's like you're not even in existence. Is there something that you try to pull out of the – out of the tool bag in that situation or is it just up to them it's most times it's uh up to that hen and most times you're going to lose that battle <laughs> and they're going to leave you that's yeah. that's a low percentage um scenario there for success um i'll think back to my the, my most recent hunt and we were dealing with a flock of hens and and gobblers and i imagine those gobblers were strutting to them because um if you watch that video i mentioned in it now these birds would gobble to my calling, but they wouldn't gobble anymore to my calling. And 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 I, you know, I said in the video, it's like 
they're basically shock gobbling to my calling. If I give them 10 minutes of quiet and then I yelp again, they gobble, but that's all I get out of them. So that tells me that they're probably just sitting there strutting to the hens. Now these birds were in one location, not moving a whole lot. I tried communicating with the hens and that didn't work. Well, we did have one hen come up and investigate, but then she went back over the hill. Um, I heard Jake's, so I started communicating with the Jake's, you know, and then I just started trying to sound like my own little flock over there. I, you know, uh, I may have thrown in a kiki or something, but I jake up and hen up. And I finally told my buddy, I said, you know, the one thing I haven't tried is gobbling to them. They, they think there's another flock over here, but they're content with it being hens and jakes, maybe Jenny's and jakes. And so I gobbled and boy, they lit up. I mean, the gobblers, gobblers gobbled, the hens started. Bow, 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 bow. And, um, and I yelped and Jake yelped and I gobbled again. They went crazy again. I think I threw in one more gobble and then I just stopped. And like moments later, the whole flock come over talking and we were able to get one. And so in those things, I was, there's no, I don't have a, I guess a good answer. Just try things. You know, you don't have anything to lose at that point. Once you decide that, Hey, nothing's working, just start experimenting and see what, what happens. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good, that's a good piece of advice. And looking back on my younger days where I'd be in that same situation, I think back to just making the same, you know, same note yelp every time and he gobbles and then it's like, okay, well, he's still interested. And it's like, well, is he really, you know, with more experience now, I know he probably wasn't in a lot of those situations. And I feel that that's kind of a hang up for, um, a lot of folks in that situation is he gobbles and that reconfirms that he's there, but what's the next step? And I think you really have a couple options is try all the calls that you can manage and try to sound like different, you know, visualize the situation you're trying to create or move, <laughs> you know, because yeah. in those times it seems like a lot of, you know, results end up being, yeah, you don't slowly ha- moves off. You, you don't have but like three choices in that scenario. Try to other calls, quit calling all together, or move. Try to reposition. I mean, that's basically all you got. Unless you want to just crawl, like in our uh, situation. If I wasn't filming this hunt, and I, you know, if I was by myself, I could have probably just crawled over and looked over the hill and shot one. But that takes kind of the fun out of it for me. I've done it before, but. I always have more satisfaction when I actually call them to me and and uh, can get them coming in front of me. It's interesting that that's the case. Like in general, everybody has their own opinion on that <laughs> because I'm the type where I'm like, I love calling them in, and I feel like in recent years I've gotten better at that and more um, willing to try different things to try to pull them in but at the end of the day i love to just make that move you know there's some mm-hmm. thrilling about that as well so oh yeah uh, especially if you're in tight and you think okay but i may i may just ruin this hunt oh yeah and so there, it gets the heart rate increased and you know one one little mistake and it's all over and especially if you're trying to you're still in, in this uh in the act of getting into that new position and they gobble mm-hmm. you know closer <laughs> Or, in, in, or or they move and then you're like, oh no, it's, this is not working out or I'm in a tight spot, <laughs> you know? So yep. it's, it, it makes it exciting, no doubt. Yeah, my favorite one that comes to mind is I was hunting with uh, my friends Colin and Keith and I was behind them trying to pull the turkey past Colin and uh, these turkeys were in a group I actually think it was three or four long beards with one hen, as weird as that was. Mm-hmm. And they just would not break the the ridge. They were just off of it. And it was one of those deals where it was like we kind of went through the list of all the options. You know, we'd be aggressive with them, and then we'd lay off, and we'd not call at all and just scratch. And then, you know, you go down the line of all the things. And at that time, I wasn't as confident in a Jake Yelp or anything, so I didn't try that. But eventually just got to that point where it's like, I don't know that they're going to come that extra 10, 15 yards. You start making the crawl. And one thing that I really like doing in those situations and gives me a little bit of confidence is just scratch my way to them. Because I think that's something that 
you know, if you've never done that before, you feel like you may be making too much noise. Well, you're already trying to sound like a turkey, so if you just scratch your way there and then listen for the spitting, drumming, scratching, and just try to keep cover between you and them, I mean, yeah, that's, that's a, always a good approach. Yeah, that's a great point. I always forget about that. It's a, it's a great technique. It's a great call. I consider it a call, scratching in the leaves. Um, and I, and I, I find myself forgetting a lot of times I'm sitting there working a bird and I'm like, you know, I haven't even bothered scratching in the leaves. Let me try that. You know, and, uh, that brings up a, something I just thought about, um, a lot. I get a lot of comments cause I call a lot, you know, um, when I'm working birds, you, if you're watching my videos, you very rarely see me just sitting quietly or just doing a couple of clucks and just sit there. And I get a lot of comments from, well, not a lot, but I get a segment of comments that are like, well, you should call a lot, or maybe you should not call so much, and they you know, come in. You're an much. over-caller. Yeah, and <laughs> I <laughs> I grew up raising turkeys. I, I spent a lot of time growing up uh, around them and, and in the woods. Turkeys talk a lot. They talk more than clucks a few times, and you know there are days that are not very vocal, but a group of birds near each other, they're constantly talking to each other. So it's not abnormal for you to call a lot and the birds say, oh, you know what? That hen sure is calling too much. I'm not going over there. No, they're just not going over because they're not interested or whatever. Or your calling is really bad and, and they're turned off by it. Um, but uh, I say this to people that that's probably, I think, one of the biggest myths out there over calling. I don't think there's, there are situations where you need to choose your words wisely and how much you talk. But in the, in a general sense, there's no really no such thing as a turkey that talks too much or over calling. I think that uh, the only situations where I switch up my calling to being more subtle is where I've witnessed many people hunting the same turkeys. Like there's been particular public land, especially some of the stuff that I've hunted in Ohio or. I know the mm -hmm. same thing was the case in Pennsylvania where there's these really visible turkeys and they're getting called to, you know, people are just sloppily pulling in, hitting the same call over and over or kind of general sounds, I guess. And I've noticed that pushing turkeys away. I've watched it happen before, but I don't necessarily disagree that you can over call. I think that's like situational. I think, being aware of that is important. So like, yeah, that, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, that, that's an interesting point because I've had it happen where a bird, like on, uh, I'm sure it was a heavily pressured area. It was late in the season, so it's seen some pressure. And there was a bird that every time I made a peep, he turned around and went the other way. And I don't think necessarily that it was like over calling I, I, or that he thought was, I was a hunter. I think that he had probably, he was a subordinate. He'd probably gotten beaten up and he just didn't want to associate with any other turkeys period. And as soon as he heard a hen yelp and he's like, okay, I hear a hen. There's probably a Tom around or, you know, or a mature gobbler that's going to kick my butt. I'm out of here. Sometimes it can be pressure. You know, and I think about that and probably overthink about it too. Sometimes I go like if I'm in Mississippi or Alabama or back home in South Carolina and I'm hunting on public where I know they get pounded, there's a truck there every day at the gate. I'm probably going to be a little more, more reserved in my initial calling, just filling that bird out. Where if I'm hunting up here in Minnesota and Iowa, Wisconsin, I don't, I don't have those uh, thoughts as often. Now I do run into birds up here that like me and Garrett were hunting the year before last. We roosted this bird first yelp that morning. I mean, he was gobbling on the roost good. First little yelp, he shut up, didn't make another peep until he hit the ground and i'm like yeah that bird's seen some pressure but you never know until you make that first sound mm -hmm. but those instances are far fewer for me than they are you know the opposite situation so i go with the percentages i just go in there and, and start talking to them and, and fill them out and then i'm i call a lot call aggressive <laughs> most often than not but yeah, yeah. i it, i would say if, for the most part i do the same thing. I didn't when I was younger, but I also was slacking on my calling practice. It's something I've changed over the last several years is, you know, just having more confidence going into it. And therefore I am 
more aggressive ultimately. But I do have a question along those lines of pressured areas. Do you ever feel that there is a certain location? Like, for example, on public land, there's a lot of times a gate and a trail that, you know, Forest Service or, you know, on that particular WMA or whatever they're using to manage the land. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that sometimes calling from those obvious locations and really pressured areas is something that, like, turkeys have seen, therefore they maybe aren't as likely to gobble in those situations? Like, do you ever approach it trying to hit it from a different angle that maybe other hunters haven't if you know people have been in there? Yeah, I've I've mixed it up because I have that fear sometimes that they've uh, they've learned to associate calling coming from this area is not good news. You know, just like gravel on the road or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of times, you know, I may go through there and and coyote howl or or owl hoot first, and then run a pot call. And if I can get one to gobble, I'm certainly not going to set up right there and try to call him to it. I want to get down in the woods with him. Um, and then other times I, I take the easy route. I may work that access road into the end, but I plan a route to come, you know, through the woods on the way back far from it. So if there was a goblin nearby, I'm covering him from two different locations. Um, I mean, I've had a lot of success striking birds from those access trails and I've seen the map or the, I don't know if it was Chamberlain or, or one of those studies, the, um, deer university or whatever it was that showed, um, the GPS locations of the hunters and how much area they covered. And they covered like 20% of the WMA and it was all around the access roads. And the way I look at it is I don't look at where I'm walking. I'm looking at where my sound is emitting to, you know, my, my, my calling's reaching out a half mile in both directions. And so I, with that thought, I'm like, they surely can't pinpoint me from a half mile away, right to this road. I may be, you know, a hundred yards in the woods. So, um, I don't, I consider it, let's put it that way. It's in the back of my mind and sometimes it affects my decision maker making, but for the most part, you know, I'm not afraid to walk those roads and call and just to try and strike one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's a good way to look at it. Specifically the, where your sound is going. That's something that I feel like as I hunt hilly mountainous terrain more and more, I'm always picking up on little details where, well, maybe he doesn't hear me in that little hole if that's where he's there. Maybe I have to move up and try to cast it down in there a little bit more specifically. And I feel like that's uh, just yeah, always I've, fun to learn more of. I've had situations just like that where you can call and call and now hoot and coyote howl and nothing, but you you go 100 yards just so your sound's getting over that hill and you hear one down, way down in there in the bottom. And he may have been gobbling to calls earlier i just couldn't hear him mm -hmm. or it wasn't loud enough for him to trigger a gobble so it sometimes you just have to make that little step over that that little ledge sometimes or closer to it yeah it's pretty funny when i look back on the things that i didn't know when i first started hunting the hills and i would you know the way i would travel the way that i would think that i should be hearing a turkey and just how much you know, experience helps that where you start to realize, well, this probably isn't the most effective or efficient way to work through this. And I think that, um, one of my favorite things is when you have like a windy day, for example, in hilly country, I kind of like that sometimes, especially if it keeps people out of the woods, because I feel like you can kind of anticipate how turkeys are going to avoid that wind you know if you got a lot of terrain they're probably going to be tucked on the downwind side of that so a lot of times i just completely scratch like well i'm not going to look on the upwind side of the hill as much unless i need to but like if i'm going to create a a route through this you know i may just specifically target one side of the ridge where on another day where it's calm i wouldn't have that same approach but, yeah i'm I'm the, I'm the same way i and I don't have any proof of this, but I I have a theory that turkeys, even though they're they have these big holes in the side of their head for ears, that you would think it would cause the same issue. Like when it's really windy, you can't hear anything. All you hear in your ears is whoosh, 
and you're trying to turn and, and cut the wind so you can get the right angle to hear. And I think that they are actually able to hear better in the wind than we are. And I'm not concerned about where they're located uh, per se. I'm trying to get to a point where the wind's not blowing right across the edge of my ears so I can at least hear. And so I'll get off that leeward side of that hill or I'll ru run those bottoms. And even though that turkey may be up right on top of that ridge and it, right in direct contact with that 30 mile per hour uh, sustained wind, he, he seems to always, you know, still hear me. And so I just want to benefit my hearing and not so worried. You no, know, I get a question all the time. It's like, what do you do on windy days? Uh, I mean, do you hunt here, like anticipating that's where the turkeys are? No, I'm just trying to get to places I can hear and I can reach my calling out. And that's usually on leeward sides or down in those little, those little valleys and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, if you have terrain, you're way better off getting just 20 yards down the hill than you are standing up on the top even though on that calm day you may, may be better off to be right at the tip top where you can hear 360 yeah, yeah. on that windy day it's a lot of times worth it just to drop down in there and i found too on super windy days that's where you'll find sometimes that turkey that he'll go all the way to the very bottom and i feel like that's something in really cut up terrain with a whole bunch of you know fingers and um, secondary ridges and stuff like that. Yeah, that's like, that's that's kind of one of the things I I, I do a lot is run those uh, valleys right mm -hmm. in the bottom. That that twenty miles of hiking I told you about. It was really windy on one of those days. It was breezy one day and really windy the next. And we just ran those those valleys. Now we didn't hear any birds, but we found a lot of fresh scratching down in there. And I'm like, they're right here somewhere. We just got to find them. And it was obvious that they were moving down into those valleys and whether it was the wind that caused it or not, but, um, we were finding all the fresh sign down there. And so had I continued hunting there for another day or two, I felt, you know, pretty confident we probably would stumble on the birds in those areas. Mm -hmm. Sign is something that I feel like I have always paid attention to but one of the things that when i early on in this conversation i said something about like the things that you know i may be thinking about in a given season and a couple seasons ago i had this experience where we were way up on a high point and we came in this weird way where there was no access trails around and i really didn't expect many people if anybody had hunted in this area all season and thinking about like what our call could hit, we specifically walk to this knob. Mm -hmm. So we're way up high, and we've got the main valley kind of down to our right, and you know from that there's all these fingers. Well, we got up there, and there was a bunch of scratching, and it was like, hmm, you know, this is a good sign. Nothing real fresh, but you could tell they had been in the area. And I got on, started with mouth call, then moved to a crystal call. Got pretty loud with that and hear bird gobbles, probably three, 350, up one of those little finger valleys or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. And I started looking at it like, man, like he's a long way away. I think if we drop off this knob and wrap around him and get up above him, we can pull him up that finger a little bit easier. Basically get on the same, you know, piece of terrain as him instead of trying to call him through that valley and up our ridge. Well... He gobbled a handful of times, and then he just went quiet. But again, he was, like, way down in there. Like At that point, I never even really considered – I shouldn't say I never considered. I thought about it a little bit, but I was like, we should get closer. Well, sure enough, as soon as we drop off there, he gobbles again, and he's, like, coming up that finger that we – or that knob that we had just left. Yeah. And we had to scramble to make a setup, and long story short, he got to – where we were we were down in the saddle and we could see him standing up there like 100 yards just you know looking down at us and was it i'm trying to remember this seems like a familiar video i've watched um, yeah it was a video we were uh, it was keith and i hunting with our friend jacob okay. and uh, we that, had a whole bunch of trial was that, was that ohio trial or new york or something yeah it was ohio okay um yep. you know speaking of fresh sign the one thing that i love hunting over it's fresh gobbler tracks 
and I, I don't mean I don't mean knowing that they're fresh. Like it rained overnight, and you're walking these trails the next day trying to strike a bird, and you cut fresh gobbler tracks. I'm gonna set up and I'm a blind call and sit there and wait for about an hour, because a lot of times he's within hearing distance. He may not gobble to your calling, but he's probably heard it. And we did that. Um, there's been a couple of hunts. One of them where that bird, I saw the fresh tracks and I was like, all right, let's just get up to this bin and we'll make a call. Made a call and he gobbled 200 yards away. And we set up, I called again. He didn't gobble. I said, all right, let's just sit here. And sure enough, here he come. It was like 15 minutes later or so. He come creeping in around the curve looking for us. And, and there was another instance that, that happened also. And I was like, man, this has paid off twice when I found fresh gobbler tracks. And so I make it a point. Now, I don't find them very often, you know, like fresh ones. You got to go in there right after a rain. And just the way my hunting schedule occurs, it, I don't get those very often. But when I, when I when we get a fresh rain or something and I know there's fresh gobbler tracks, I'm sitting down. I'm going to call a little bit, maybe some cutting. If nothing gobbles to it, I'm going to just sit there and wait for at least, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. And mm -hmm. it'll pay off sometimes. I think it's a great strategy and something that, I definitely feel more confident every year doing as well because there just is enough situations where whether it's a track, I mean track being the best, mm -hmm. a very fresh track right after rain is is the best. But even with scratching or uh, sign where you know maybe you can tell they roosted close by. Whatever whatever it is that's telling you that there definitely was turkeys here. Fresh fresh drop gobbler droppings, you know, anything yeah. like that. Take it take it and squish it and see how much moisture's in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's definitely worth doing because if he was just there, there's a good chance that he'll come back. And I think that that's one of my favorite solutions for just a generally slow day. I mean, we've all been in the situations like what you've described earlier walking 20 miles, you know, covering a whole bunch of ground, trying to strike a turkey, and that's that, just not working. Yeah, that first <laughs> sign can really uh, kind of pep up your morale. Maybe not a whole lot, but if you haven't heard anything, you've been, you know, busting your hump all morning, you haven't seen any fresh sign, and then you come up on fresh sign, fresh gobbler track especially, and you're like, okay, there's one around here. That kind of right there mentally gives you a little pickup. And then just sit down and call. I mean, it's things like that. Um, at, at the very least, you get to sit down and take a little break, you know? Yeah. Because you've been hunting hard on one. Yeah, and I think that you're legitimately in the game. I mean, there's been tons of times where, you know, one's come in and caught us off guard and we messed it up. Or one's, you know, eventually fired off and we got him. Or just hearing one and then having him roosted for the next morning. I, I really like that um, strategy let's say you hunt the morning and you never leave the woods and you just keep hunting all day and you're traveling, but you hit that one, you know, spot where there's a bunch of sign and just go set up there for the evening and just listen, especially if you're way back in there or something, you know, you know, probably not going to be a lot of people hearing a turkey from this spot first thing in the morning. Yep. I really like that strategy, especially for the evening. Cause it does seem like in a lot of situations, even if they've been quiet all day or the weather's not that good, you know, they may give you a few little complimentary gobbles there <laughs> towards dark and that might be enough to get him or, you know, get him the following yep. morning. Yeah. That, that worked out for me and my buddy Dusty uh, a couple of years ago, we were, uh, I filmed him, uh, get one that morning. And then that uh, we hunted throughout the day, had a few birds we worked, but they were so far off. And I was like, well, let's just work our way up to this ridge where one was roosted this morning. Uh, we're walking call, and then we'll get there, and we'll just sit down and prepare for roosting time, you know, and something may come in. And we had, you know, totally unprepared. We weren't planning for a bird to come in. I, was, I made some calls. I was sitting there talking to him about, I think he was looking at the weather on his phone, and I was looking at mine. We were just chatting. And I just kind of, I had a 360 camera going, so it caught that these gobblers just snuck in right from our left and I just happened to turn up and I was like, Oh, don't move gobblers right in front of us. <laughs> and, you know, totally wasn't expecting that to happen, but you know, we were in a spot that we knew birds were at that morning and went there just to finish out the day. And it worked out, you know, birds came in, they heard us, never made a peep, just walked in. Yep. 
I think that that's, again, one of those things that it almost takes a few times for it to happen for you to have the confidence to just commit to doing it because, like, I really like to move. So I'll get caught up and like, well, it's like, I'm going to try to find one that's goblin. I want to try to find one that's yeah. goblin. But sometimes you just got to, you know, it's, cut your losses and relax. Yeah. Speaking of how, how your hunting techniques and how your strategies have changed since when you first started, I don't know how, how you hunted when you first started, but you know, my, my idea of hunting, I guess from reading magazines and stuff growing up was to sit in one spot and make some calls and just wait. And after a couple of hours, if that didn't pan out, walk, you know, 400 yards this way, sit down again, make some calls and wait. And I killed birds that way, but man, it was, it was boring to some degree, you know, well, to a lot of degrees. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then when I started learning, you know, running and gunning, I never looked back. Now there, there are times where I'll sit there. Like I said, if you get on up in the day and you're tired, make a few calls. And that's my strategy when I blind call now. I don't sit there and call like every 15 minutes, like the magazines used to tell us, make a yeah. few calls and wait 15 minutes. I get there. I make a few calls. I may cut a little bit and call and I put my calls down. I don't make another peep. I sit there and wait because I want them. I'm hoping they don't exactly pinpoint me and they'll make a noise when they get within, you know, 50 to a hundred yards, you know, just outside of gun range. And they're looking for that hen. They know she's in this area, but they haven't quite pinpointed her. And then, you know, gobble or they drum and give their position away so that you're ready before they sneak on in there. And that's worked out for me many times. Yeah, that's a really good tip. I think I, I've i read the same things that you've you read, Yeah, the same subscription, like, huh? <laughs> exactly. It's like. You want to, you know, purr and cluck and, you know, keep it really basic and just do that every 15 minutes or so. And it's like, I mean, may, maybe, but I also really like the same strategy that you have is hit them hard, lay off, and then just be patient. Because there's a lot of times it seems like that turkey that maybe is the subordinate turkey he maybe hears it, and this is how I visualize. Tell yeah, me if you I'm, think. I'm visualizing the same way. I know exactly yeah, where you're like, going with this. He's kind of standing there scratching, and he hears you call pretty aggressive, and he's like, and then nobody gobbles. Yeah. And it's like, hmm. You know, he starts to get a little bit of confidence about him, exactly. and then 10 minutes later, <laughs> bow, you know, he, he, he gobbles, and then now you know you're in the game. And I think that that happens a lot where we hit a call, and then nothing happens, and – you know, 10 minutes later. So even when running and gunning, sometimes I'll get to those positions where I know my call is really going a long way and I'll do that same thing, especially if I can get up on a high point where I can hear a lot, or I feel that it's pretty realistic that a hen has been in that area. And maybe she would be doing the same thing where she's like, Hey, is anybody around? And then she just goes back to feeding. You know, you hit some calls like that. Yeah. Listen, never know. He may just crack off across the valley or something and now you're in the game where yeah i envision, just... I envision it exactly like you said i'll sit there and make some calls and and the, the thoughts that go through my head is there's a there's a subordinate out there that heard me and he's like okay i'm gonna sneak on in and check this hen out or there's that older bird that knows better than to talk and he may come in so in both situations you're probably going to get a bird that's going to sneak in quietly at if if you're very fortunate, he may gobble, you know, once out there in the distance, or once when he gets close and give you a heads uh, heads up that he's in the area, or drumming or something. And a lot of times they, they just actually just appear. You know, you hear mm -hmm. footsteps and leaves, and then there he is. So I mean, and those those can be exciting. All of a sudden, you're, and it usually you're not waiting there a whole long time. It's like 15 or 20 minutes, and all of a sudden there's one appearing, or or you hear him walking. I got a really, really uh, bad experience doing that one time with Jake. It wasn't that bad. It's kind of funny. It was even funny at the moment, but we were sneaking our way into this piece of public. We were in Mississippi, and there was a good ways back in there. There was a high knob, and it was a generally flat area, but from that position, we felt like we could hear a lot, and we felt like it would be a good place to just hang out midday. Well, sure enough, we sit down. We're facing this way. And we call, and within 10 minutes or so, we just hear something walk, and it's that, I call it the hunter doubt, where mm -hmm. it's like, 
you hear something and you're just like, it's a oh, squirrel. there's no way that can be with it. Yeah, it's a squirrel. <laughs> and sure enough, like Jake gets more turned than I did because I was at the time still using a tripod. This is exactly <laughs> one of the reasons I'm anti-tripod for filming hunts. If you don't film hunts, you got nothing to worry about. But I'm all handheld if I can be. And sure enough, there he is, Tom, right behind us. But he was, Jake was on this side of me. So I was between him and the turkey, and he yeah. got away. But if I'm classic, been, yeah, back on your, uh, I hate to change the, the subject, but that no. made me think about it when I was filming that my buddy last week. I I carry my camera with the tripod just so we can, I can set it up and get static shots like audio or like the moon or whatever. But when I'm filming somebody, I'm I'm like you, because you're gonna get all contorted sometimes. You like and like in his situation. I'm filming over his shoulder and the birds came out to a right. He had this, I asked him, I was like, can you shoot left hand? He's like, yep. I said, okay. As soon as he goes behind something, you swap. He swaps his gun. I'm turned like this tripod. You never would have, unless you pick up the whole tripod. So I understand that part. A little, <laughs> a little divergent there, but <laughs> dude, I like that. Though. I mean, you're going to get hung up in situations and it doesn't matter if you're talking filming or hunting. Yeah. It brings up a really good, topic and a little promotion for your uh reels and tiktoks you're making these days dude i laughed so much at that one that you made where you're filming behind you, oh, and you yeah. do the, the roll over and then snap to it's jason Bourne. that's so funny Man, if you I have felt, not watched that I felt you should so, watch it i felt so old and out of shape when i did that too i was like look how slow i'm moving you know i watched it back <laughs> and i guess that's what made it so funny it's like that's jason Bourne. it's like a a big a <laughs> big donut rolling around on the hill there. Dude, that's hilarious. You'll, so, you'll love my, my newest reel when you get when you get off here, the one with my moss me shooting my mossberg. Yeah, I'll check it out. <laughs> it, it's not <laughs> it's not actually me shooting it, but it's just a funny reel. I uh think that one of the things that you know my friend Ben. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever met Ben or not, but did I meet? I that wasn't him. No, that wasn't him with the uh, Keith. That was, it was his brother. Yeah, when we were Minnesota. tracking, tracking. Yep. So Ben and I were talking one time, and I, f I feel like this is something that we talk about all the time now, and it has been, you know, really helpful. And something that I'm a big believer in is just making the move. I think looking back to Again, the earlier days of when I was hunting and didn't have very much experience, I would have turkeys coming in and I would freeze. I would panic. I would think, oh, I can't do anything. And now I feel completely the opposite. Like if I want one to pop over the ridge and he's, you know, still 40, 45 yards away and I want him to get, you know, up there to 25 or whatever, 30 I'll just reach down and scratch or whatever, but I'm basing that all off of still listening to those specific sounds he's making. So, for example, if I hear him step, step, spit, and drum, as he's doing that drum, I know that he's probably not going to just break strut and walk straight up here. So if yeah. I want to give him that little extra, I'll sit there and scratch and move, you know, readjust and get my gun pointed in the right direction. And I feel like that's just something that when you hunt with – like a newer turkey hunter, you start to realize those are things you kind of take for granted that you start doing. And it may be turn all the way on the backside of the tree or roll around your camera tripod or whatever. It's like you you have to make them move, though, yeah, because you, otherwise he's going to pop his head up and bust you. So it's yeah, like I'd rather make the move and risk it than get busted for Yeah, you're not, not going to get the move. shot. You're not going to get the shot if you don't make the move. And, and the only thing that can hurt is you bump and making the move. Or you may not bump them. I mean, you, you. I listen to you describe yourself, and it sounds so much like me because early on, I was afraid to make moves, and now, I'm, I move so much. I'm so, and it seems like I'm so careless in my movements and stuff out in the woods on the videos. And I get a lot of comments about that. Man, you would never get away with that in Mississippi. And I'm like, no, I would get away with it because I'm, I'm, I've learned through experience what I can get away with. The one, the one uh, that I shot earlier this year where I saw him be bop, bopping across the ridge and 
and then he disappeared. But then he gobbled, and just from his sound, I knew he was over the lip of that ridge enough. That's why I knew I could roll out from behind my uh, under my tripod and get away with that. Now, mm-hmm. take me when I was 16 or 17, put me in that same situation. I never would have been facing behind me left-handed. When he gobbled the first time, I would have just froze and been sitting there like, okay, I hope you walk by me, you know? But now, you know, I've learned to judge distances, sounds, where they're coming from, um, you know, brush, everything. You know, uh, the turkey's behavior, what he's probably going to do just by reading his body language. And you, you've you obviously gone through the same stages I have, you know, to go from being frantic to more relaxed and you know what you can get away with as you get more experience. I like what you said about feeling like it could be perceived as careless because I was talking about scratching. That's a situation where I know if I saw myself do that, you know, if I could go back 10 years and take, you know, myself at that experience level and show, you know, that guy what I'm doing now yeah. with the scratching, it'd be like, what are you doing? You know, you can't do that. You're never going to get away with that. But it really is just about – like understanding and relating sounds that they're making to what they may or may not be able to see because yeah. of what they're doing. Yeah, they're telling they're telling on themselves with things they do. And mm-hmm. man, I wish I could go back to when I was fourteen or fifteen and tell my fourteen year old self everything I know. <laughs> well, yep. I'd, I'd kill a thousand gobblers by now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it really is funny how it takes the experience to like get you know one of the things that i feel and i battle with with this podcast specifically is when talking hunting strategy at the end of every conversation it's like you just got to keep trying you got to just keep trying new things because until you do something that's different or you know outside of the norm of what you typically do you don't really know what the result will be whether it's good or bad you have to try something to learn. And I feel that, you know, it's easier to, when you're younger, to feel that there's not going to be a next time or like this yeah. is the best opportunity. I can't blow it, so I'm not going to try it on this time. Maybe next time. Yeah, but then you a, never really pull the trigger. That's a good. That's actually a good point for anyone that's new or young turkey hunter or new turkey hunter is what you just said. There may not be a next time. And so then you push the issue you push the envelope you make shots you shouldn't mm-hmm. um you know as i got more experience and got older i did i don't take you know those questionable shots um like i like recently i had a bird behind me for a half hour and i could see his head and it was brushing away and i probably could have popped you know popped right through that brush with my gunshot and may have killed him good good probability but I've killed enough gobblers in my life and I've been in enough situations. Plus this was like day one. And I'm like, there'll probably be other opportunities. Um, and, and so th- that, you know, gets a lot of people in a lot of trouble where they they'll miss. And then that's the worst feeling. I'd rather pass one and, and know that I had the opportunity then to shoot and they run off. And man, that used to get to me bad when I was younger. I mean, for like a week or two straight, I just moped around like, man, I can't believe it reliving that shot in my head now if, yep. now i've missed so many times in my life that <laughs> i don't even give it a second thought <laughs> yeah this it is funny though because like i really do think back to younger days and the hunter doubt is truly a huge hang-up for a lot of people is you just think well there's no way that could really be happening or there's no way i could get away with that or you doubt in yourself that there will be a next time. You think that, oh, this is the only time I'm going to see this big Tom or this big buck or whatever it may be. So then, like you said, you force the issue, mm-hmm. make a bad shot or whatever. But I think as you get older, you get more experience, you realize, okay, there is going to be other awesome experiences where the turkey comes in. You just you know start to get a little bit of relaxation. And that's not to say that guys like you and I still don't have – heart rate going through the roof oh, you know yeah. your head the heart beats pounding in your ears as the turkey's coming up like i mean listen to our wireless mics in these hunts and you know that's true <laughs> yeah go go back and watch that video of me with that bird behind me up on the ridge the the jason Bourne one 
and listen to me. I, I don't know if it's in the video, but I remember saying to myself when that was going on, I was like, I feel like I'm hyperventilating. I mean, I couldn't <laughs> breathe. I couldn't, I don't know what was going on. Somebody even made a comment about it. I said, boy, I've never heard you breathe that hard. I was like, I don't know what was going on at that moment, but I was, I thought I was going to have to breathe in a brown paper bag there for a moment. <laughs> it, it got crazy and thankfully it worked out. But yeah, we uh, still get it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's like, it's not to say that we're not still feeling those things. It's just that you have more control and you're more aware of those yeah. little, little things, you know. I tell it's people like, that all the time They that when they ask me, how are you so calm and cool, collective? Um, I've done it enough times, but trust me, mentally, it's a mess in there. I mean, it's, and my heart rate's going, it's, it's just, I've, I guess I've learned to manage it to a degree where I can still function. On the outside, <laughs> it appears that I'm normal, but on the inside, I'm not. I'm just as shook up as I was when I was 15 years old when the gobbler came in. That's awesome. I mean, it's what keeps us coming back yeah. for sure. I mean, I definitely wouldn't turkey hunt if I didn't get that feeling anymore. No, it would just get it would just get boring. And I yes. think the one hunt that really comes to mind that I made a move that I don't think that uh, I would have even a few years ago. And there's a couple cool aspects of this, and you know maybe it could have been played a different way, but it's one that I'm just really proud of what Ben and I did in this situation to pull this off. So we had heard this turkey from across the valley, and he was gobbling on his own a lot. He was a long way away. To cut straight down and across to him, it would have been like 600 yards, but to go all the way and take the top around to him, it was going to end up being like over a mile. Well, we decided that due to the lack of cover and early season conditions, you yep. Let's just take the, the ridge around, and hopefully he's going to give away his location. So he ends up gobbling again once we get over there, and we're up on a knob. And we can see fresh scratching behind us, and he's out here in front of us. We get set up, and it's pretty thick, but we can see the, the ridge leading out towards where he is. And he's gobbling quite a bit still on his own, and... I was like, you know, he's alone, he's gobbling a lot, I'm just going to call once and just see kind of how he reacts to it. And I had this suspicion that I, he would be gobbling a bunch on his own, and then I'd call and he wouldn't respond directly. And when that's the case, I like to play it a little bit different. I've had enough experiences where the turkey's gobbling a bunch on his own, you make a call, he goes quiet for a minute, and he maybe responds, but it's like delayed. Like maybe two minutes later, maybe even 30 seconds later, but it's not that yelp, 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 gobble. It's yep. yelp, and he hears it, and then he delay gobbles. So sure enough, that was the case. And I really only called, I think, that one time because he was so delayed. He was several minutes after it. And sure enough, he came down that ridge right on the spine of it, and he would walk, and he would look. And I mean, he would stand there in the same spot and just look in our direction. And every time he'd get behind a tree or something, I'd give it a scratch. Mm -hmm. But as soon as he'd get back to where he could see, he'd just stand there. And I was like, I, I had this suspicion that he was going to be weird like that. Where, on the other hand, you have another turkey that, you know, he gobbles immediately to your call. He walks right up the ridge right to you, comes right into the setup, and it's perfect. Well, I just yeah. something about the way that he was gobbling made me feel that this could be the case. And that's, sure that's enough. one of the things that comes with experience, just to, mm -hmm. to interject that. That's things you are going to learn and pay attention to for all you new hunters. Yep. And I feel like, I mean, we go through a whole bunch of situations, but it's like you can almost tell what type of turkey he is just based off how he's gobbling, how frequent, how loud, where he is within the terrain. Stuff like that can really help, yep. you know learn those and you know again just with experience but anyway he got to where he could see and you could tell it was driving him crazy he eventually started kind of strutting quarter strutting a little bit or half strutting and instead of coming down the ridge to us though he circled right over the ridge and then came around the back side of that knob like straight up right behind us ends up popping up you know to where we can eventually 
I think we actually could hear him the whole time. It was pretty crunchy. But he makes this full-on circle around us. And, you know, there gets to be that point where it's like, well, I'm definitely going to have to make a move because he's now past my hard right. I have to go all the way back over to the left and get turned directly behind me. And I eventually did it as he's coming up the backside of the ridge, and he's going to be at point blank. And I think we ended up stepping it off at right about 10 yards. But as I'm trying to turn to make those moves, I'm in Greenbrier and stuff, and instead of panicking and moving too fast or ripping through that stuff, I just stayed calm. And any time I could get my hand on the ground, I would scratch to cover what I was doing. And then I just got right up against the tree and my gun right on the right side to where only my gun barrel and my right eye is sticking out. And then I just mm -hmm. let him eventually come up there. But it's like I look back on that situation and I think, man, if I would have done that when I was 15, 16, even probably 20, I'd have never made that move, man. I'd have got so – I would have been like, you know, I can't move. I can't do anything. He's going to come behind me. He's going to see me. Well, Or you, or you would have called to him when he's looking right at you. Yes. You know, that, that's yes. big mistakes I made growing up. And I, yep. I learned, I learned not to do that. But I mean, that's, I, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I wanted to touch on that point. That was such a, a great read. I mean, obviously you've, you've done it long enough, but I, I see things like that. And when you, the way you described it, it's a great read because that the way that bird delayed gobbled, the way it came in there looking, that's a totally different uh, characteristic of a gobbler. I mean, that's a totally different gobbler than that other one. And if you can pick up on those subtle cues and, and, and then you know how to react, you know, um, don't, don't call when he's looking at you. Don't scratch when he's looking at you. Um, a, a lot, a lot of those things, you know, and, and that right there will set the tone for the, the rest of the hunt, how, mm -hmm. how you finish this bird. Yeah. And one actually exact example that was very similar the year prior I was hunting and it was almost the same setup. It was with Ben. It was the same acting turkey in the same terrain feature. And what we did was we heard somebody else calling. So we started calling more aggressive. Even though mm -hmm. that other caller was further behind us, this turkey was going nuts. But then when I called, it was that same deal. He had that super delayed reaction. It was like he was gobbling and everything, anything and everything or it actually wasn't that. So what is also interesting about that individual, in my opinion, and I, I think that, you know, you could be listening to this and think I'm totally full of it, but I'd be curious of your opinion, Shane. So that turkey, a lot of times, he's not gobbling at something. He's doing it on his own time. Like, he's not gobbling at the crow. He's gobbling you know, just whenever at nothing, he's just making that it's decision. It's like if you would, if you would play a recording of his gobble on repeat and then other sounds are going on. So you just associated that. Okay. He gobbled to the crow, even though it wasn't immediately after he gobbled to it when he's just out there gobbling. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. He's like, he's just doing it randomly free, very frequently, but it's like on his own time where he's not just shot gobbling at the crow. Now, on the other hand, there's a turkey that he goes, stands way up high, and he and he gobbles. And every time, like, you call or a crow flies over, a woodpecker goes over, he gobbles to it directly after it. Where this guy, on the other hand, kind of the one that I now tend to play differently, is just gobbling a lot, but it's not really at anything in particular. He specifically does not gobble right after the call or the crow or the woodpecker. He's just doing it on his own time. Yeah, I, f I feel those birds are just broadcasting their location mm -hmm. and to to round up whatever he wants to round up, a hen or another gobbler buddy, which mm -hmm. just reminded me, I want to I want to talk about this real quick because it's yeah. locked in my head. Uh, I had a buddy call me the other day. And he's like, man, there's this gobbler I've been, been trying to hunt. And he he gobbles, he flies down, and he gobbles his head off, but he's uh, he goes away, and he's going away. And it's like two days in a row, he's just gobbling his head off, but he doesn't care about hens or anything, and he's just gobbling. And I said, I told I told him, I said, I believe, now this may not be right, but he may be looking for a buddy that got shot. Because I've had that exact situation. I've got video, and I told him, I said, I should put a little video together of footage 
of this goblin. We could identify him by his beard. He had a little spriggly little beard. Um, what, he was running with three other gobblers the day before. We shot one of them. The next day, he's just gobbling his head off. And then he comes into view. He's, we're on this field. He comes into view, he gobbles. He's got an, the, the other gobbler tagging along with him. And he's just ignoring us. And he's just gobbling and gobbling. He goes on by and he goes up the ridge behind us, goes away, just gobbling. And I told my buddy I was hunting with, I said, he's looking for his buddy that you shot yesterday. I mean, that's that's exactly what he was doing is what I interpreted it as. And I told my buddy that called me and asked me about the one recently. I said, that's what I think they're doing sometimes. When you get in that situation, like this bird flies down and he goes away gobbling. You know, it's hunting season, especially on public land. Birds are getting shot. And they have, you know, you see them running in pairs of twos or threes. One of their buddies gets shot. Man, they're looking for him, just like a, a poet looking for his mama, you know? Yep. And oh, yeah. um, so that's one scenario I wanted to touch on. It just made me think about it. That So if you, you ever get flustered, like, man, they gobble and go away from him, that could be the reason. So maybe gobble to him. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I definitely agree. I've seen the same thing where we've killed one of them and then the other one goes nuts he's gobbling a ton but he's not interested in calling he's just going to stay in that one spot and like it seems like he's just trying to like you said bring other turkeys to him yeah and, I'm, and i've seen that with birds that weren't shot you know like one roost over here um me and my buddy joel last year were hunting and there was one bird gobbling on that ridge and two where we were at and they they hit the ground and instead of coming to us they were headed straight there and i said oh they're going to meet up with their buddy they were gobbling to each other. Mm. Um, so you'll run into those situations where, you know, oh, wow, he's on fire. He's not on fire to you. He's on fire to, they're communicating. That's how yeah. gobblers talk to each other. And then when they get close, you know, they may cluck or yelp. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's a good, it's a good point. And something that I think this is something I, I can't honestly say I've ever effectively done this, but I know the time is soon. There's that frequency of gobble and that exactly the situation that your buddy called you about is turkey's gobbling, but he's on the move. And a lot of times I've seen too where that same turkey, he'll get right into position where you're like, all right, I'm on a, you know, on another turkey, it would work perfectly. He'd come right up the ridge and it would be, you know, an ideal situation. But this turkey He'll be gobbling like crazy. You get into position, you know, inside of even 100 yards sometimes, and then you call, and he's quiet, and the next thing you know, he's way over here on the next ridge, but then he starts doing it again. And I've hunted those day, those turkeys sometimes consecutively, like day after day, and he's doing the same thing. And I think that in those situations, you almost have to, like, at least this is how, the way that I have to see it for myself. It's like you got to cut your pride a little bit and just be like, hey, the only way I'm going to get this turkey is just get in front of where he wants to go. He's going to keep letting me know where he is and what route he's on. And I got to just try to get in front of him because every time I call, he's going to do something different. And it's something that I've consistently seen. And I don't see it like daily. And I'm definitely not yeah. trying to hunt that turkey. But it's like there's some years where you find you usually find it about once a year where there's that one – oddball and like again you get to a point where over time you start to recognize little tendencies within the frequency what they're gobbling to where you know they want to be in relation to terrain or vegetation or other turkeys and i just think that that's one of the things that i yeah. really like learning more about yeah and, and, and that's the thing a lot of people try to figure out turkeys and they try to put it in a certain box like Oh, they were going away from you. They're call shy. You know, they try to give a reason. And there could be a, a multitude of reasons why a bird is gobbling but going away from you. Um, it may be their buddy's lost or, or missing and they're looking for it. Maybe just a gobbler out there on the ridge casting to round up hens. It could be, especially, again, like on public or it could be on private. How many times have you shot a gobbler and they had a one or two with them, especially if it was an afternoon hunt, and they go flying across the valley to the next ridge? Well, they end up roosting over there that night. The next morning, they they wake up. They're gobbling. Where do they want to go to? They want to go straight back to where they came from. Um, or a hunter just walking through the woods bumped them. 
Yep. And and that may be the why they gobble going away from you. It may not even be anything to do with they're afraid of your calling. Maybe they're just trying to get back to where they're comfortable being. You know, mm-hmm. there's a multitude of reasons why a bird may act like they do, but don't try to put it in one box like, okay, they've had a lot of pressure or he's call shy. Um, try to think of, I like, that's the way I like to do it. I, I like to think mm-hmm. of other reasons that aren't negative. Like, yeah, oh, he's just trying to get to where he's going. I, I'll just go over there where he's going and then, then he'll be workable. I, I think that what you said about that's the way you like to think about it. I think that like critically thinking of the situation and being critical of yourself too, like not just saying like, I'm going to pick one of these excuses out of the list of, you know, well, he's call shy or there's something, you know, there's something wrong with that turkey or he doesn't, he's not acting right or whatever. It's like, <laughs> It's not supposed to be easy, yeah. you know. Like that's always one, of the, like one of my favorite things that just cracks me up that hunters consistently say is, "Well, it's just tough here." It's like, well, hell yeah, it's tough everywhere. It's like animals aren't looking to just like run down your gun barrel or yeah. you know run right into the end of your arrow. Like they are trying to survive. And yeah, I, I see know. it on social media all the time when the when somebody's posting like, "Man, I've hunted here two days in a row and they, they gobble, but nothing comes in." And, and a lot of the advice I see is like, just don't call, don't over call, sit there quietly, maybe call a little bit and just be patient. And I'm like, no, that's not what I'd be doing. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to find another turkey somewhere, you know, yep. I'm chasing the gobble. And I had a buddy at work that uh, was talking about it. the Minnesota season's open now. And he's like, man, I've been hunting this bird for a few days. And I was like, do not waste your whole season on one bird. Yeah. Um, because it'll drive you crazy. I mean, it may be a big reward for you if you finally get them, but I've I've had more negative experiences out of it than positive where I waste a whole week chasing one bird, and I'm like, man, I could have been hopping around, chasing, jumping ridges, and, you know, different pieces of public and getting on other birds and, and, uh, and having a little more fun. Um, so I don't know where I'm I was that going guy. with that. I'm that guy sometimes. Sometimes one gets under my skin, and I'm like, I got to just figure this out. And I, it – I'll do that. I usually do that a, a time or two a season where well, it's my, like I just commit a bunch of time to like figuring out one's pattern. I may do other things like I may go out on other, you know, side missions as well. But, you know, first thing in the morning or whatever my strategy may be where I'm attacking that particular turkey, I start to build some sort of pattern on it. And yeah. sometimes it pays off. And sometimes, like you said, it just ends up being real frustrating. <laughs> I, I tell you what I I tell people if they if they really want that bird, and especially if you're in a state and you can you know maybe kill two birds two tags, mm-hmm. abandon that bird for a week or two. Go after another one, then you come back and hunt them. I had a bird like that that um, I called him RG Redemption Gobbler, original <laughs> name right. Um, I missed this bird, and I was so upset missing him because we had hunted him for like three or four time straight and every time he would give us a slip he would gobble just enough come towards us and then somehow he would slip around us and he would always just be right out of gun range and i finally sat there in the rain one day um for like two hours it was like 40 degrees cold soaking rain and and then i finally got an opportunity i missed and i was so upset with with that bird you know that i was upset with myself that i missed that bird and it was getting under my skin. And I found it's like, Shane, you just need to get a break from this bird for a little bit. And I think it was two weeks later, I came back and hunted him. First time in there after that two week break, called him right in and, and it was over. And and I know someone's going to ask, well, how do you know it's the same bird? Well, up here in Minnesota and Wisconsin, we have a lot of agricultural areas with maybe a five acre block of timber or a one acre block of timber and they're spaced out pretty good. And these gobblers like to call those little certain blocks their home. You may have one here that's all the time and one over there. Um, I'm not 100% sure it's the same one, but he was the only gobbler in there every single time I got him to gobble. And so in my mind, it was the same one. <laughs> but I gave him a two-week break, and that's all it took, you know. And, yep. and I went and had fun with other gobblers. Yep. I think that, like, that's definitely a good a good strategy. And on the other hand – the one thing that I've accidentally got myself into, which again has helped me in some situations, and one in particular was in Maryland, where Keith and I kept making this same mistake day in and day out, where we'd get to where we could hear this one turkey that was roosted in a good spot, but by the time we get to him, 
sure enough, he'd be gone, or he'd be with hens, and we could never get him to gobble again, and we'd end up, you know, moving on and trying to find something else, but over time, we started to put a pattern together, and it was like three days in a row that we'd hunted in that area that he had been roosted right on that same little ridge, and we had kind of learned a route in to where we felt like it was a safe route to the location that he was uh, roosted, and we actually tried to roost him the night before. We tried to even get into a position where we may hear him fly up. Well, sure enough, we didn't hear anything. And we were like, man, like, should we just take the risk and just try to get in there in the morning? Like, every day he's right there. And, like, while we didn't hear him tonight, maybe we, you know, maybe he didn't gobble, which apparently was the case. And maybe we just couldn't hear him fly up from where we were. So we got up super early and we crawled right to, like, we had just pinned him day in and day out. Just like what you always say with the triangulation, yeah, you know, it's like yeah. we're pinning him every day and it's like the pin is in, you know, by the end of it, three days, like, you know, you're within 20, 30 yards of the trees. And even if you're pinning it from 400 yards away, it's like at a certain point, you start to nail that down. Well, we're crawling into that spot and it's, it's still dark and we're like army crawling in in the dark and all of a sudden, pow, he gobbles right above us. Oh, and I thought... He did pal. I thought somebody shot him. <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> he, he gobbles right above us, and it's like, okay, he's in here. We, it's working. And we end up getting set up, and he flew down, started to kind of work away from us and called and scratched, and he came back and got him. But that was one of those deals where it was like every day, though, we just chipped away at a little bit more info on what he was doing, and it ultimately led us to be able to take that huge risk. I mean, we got up extremely early crawled in there real alert like took so much time you know used no lights nothing just we're taking incredible caution to get in there and ultimately it paid off but it was all because of just like chipping away at it now yeah do i want to do that every day of the season to your point no but that was one of those ones where it's like it starts to get under your skin a little bit and it's like we got to do something about this <laughs> Sorry, I was uh, looking at my charging, my make sure my phone was charging. Oh, that's all good. I, I was listening. I was just, if you see me doing this, <laughs> <laughs> trying to see the percentage and what it's doing. Um, that's all good. Yeah, I've got one under my skin now, and he, he wasn't under my skin until I got back to this area. Um, last year, I hunted um, this bird. Me and Garrett Prawl had roosted mm -hmm. him. And he would, he came into like 47 yards and I just would, I, I wasn't, I didn't want to shoot past 40. That was kind of my self, uh, regulating range. I want to, you know, if one ends up being 45 and shoot it, so be it. But I, I try to gauge how far they are 40 yards and in, that's what I want to shoot. It's really irrelevant to the story. But anyway, he, he didn't quite come into gun range for me and I passed him. Then that evening. I didn't kill any birds that day. That evening, I went back to that same ridge, and, and I had the camera pointed up in that area where he roosted. And I was talking to one of my other cameras while my main camera zoomed up on, on that ridge. And I didn't realize at the time, while I'm talking, he pitches up right in, in frame and lands on that limb, right? And I should have been able to see him from where I was standing, like a couple hundred yards away. And... As I'm talking to, I can hear myself in the background talking. He goes across the limb and it was like a big pine tree there and he gets in behind it and it blocks his view. And so I look up there and I'm like, well, he may or may not be up there yet. <laughs> I said, let me owl hoot or whatever. So I owl hoot. Well, he's still up there shifting around trying to get settled on the limb. So he ignored the owl hoot. A little while later, he, you know, he got settled and I owl hoot and he gobbled. I said, oh, he's up on that ridge somewhere. Had I, had I reviewed my footage that night, I would have seen exactly where he was at. And he was pretty close to where he roosted last time. But anyway, I went in there and got in the, what I thought was the right position. And it was. The bird, he flew down the next morning. I never made a peep. I was just going based off my one uh, experience with him where he flew down the side of the hill and he took this route. And sure enough, he walked, you know, that same route. Now, I did make a, a few soft yelps and bring him up the hill a couple steps towards me. And I ended up missing that bird. Found out my red dot was off, off by like four feet. And I hit it, you know, way off from it. So it didn't even, it didn't even hit him. And I think it's the same bird I called in, you know, a half hour to an hour later when I was heading out of there because he gobbled in the direction he flew and I called him back in. 
and I didn't take the shot because I wasn't quite sure he'd stepped on across the public boundary. Mm-hmm. I know I'm rambling a little bit, but anyway, I came back the next evening and he roosted there again in the same tree. And I know they say the birds don't use the same tree over and over. This bird, I could tell by his paintbrush beard, his big, I mean, it was, if not, there's triplets in there with the same beards. He was in basically the same exact tree. And we were going to go in there and hunt him the next morning. But I had a buddy come up and I said, I'm going to let you shoot him. I'm going to video. We wake up that morning and it is like a tornado out here. I mean, it's it's lightning, hailing, and everything. I'm like, yeah, we're not going up that mountain in this mess. And I said, we'll just, we'll just give him tomorrow. He's done roosted in the same spot every morning. And the next, the next, that evening, the, the weather cleared and I went to roost him and he didn't gobble. And we didn't hunt him the next morning. We didn't go up there that morning. Just to, you know, in case he may have just not been gobbling, we went after another one. Well, he filled his tag. And so I decided I'd go after him. So that evening I tried to roost him, no gobble. Next morning, no gobble. And I'm like, what in the world happened to him? And I'm not, I know that I didn't injure him, you know, and and then he, because I was so far off from hitting him. The only thing I can think of is he moved to a different area because there were were birds across the road gobbling on the other ridges. He may have moved over there temporarily or the people in the private shot him. But he got under my skin because I felt like I let the opportunity slip away because of some storms. I was like, man, we should just put on a rain gear and just got pelted by <laughs> hail and went up there. <laughs> it's easy to say after the fact that he didn't roost there again that next day. Mm-hmm. Um, but now that I'm down here or maybe down in that area uh, this evening, I'm going to try and roost him again and see if he made it through from last year to this year. And, and uh, yeah, that's just a little side story. You could probably cut this out if you want to. <laughs> it's one of those birds that's gotten under my skin and, and, Although I haven't devoted a whole season to him, I'm I'm still thinking about him though. He's kind of got me. Nah, oh, man, it's I mean, it's fun. I feel like if those things didn't happen every once in a while, you would. It, it makes for a know. good story around the fire, at least. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and I mean, you start to end up having those like those ones that got away and all that. I mean, I think that's so fun. I have all these you know memories over the years of like. You know, the one we didn't quite get or the one we saw or you know, that turkey that just dwarfed the other, you know, long beards in the area. And I just think that sometimes that that story is fun to look back on. And also just, you know, looking at individual habits plays into that experience that we're constantly building as we go out more and more. It's like you watch one individual turkey do certain things and later down the road you might see it a tendency with another one that's very similar and maybe that helps you adjust for that next time so i think that at the end of the day if you're hunting whether you know you're doing the right things or the wrong things you're always getting more experience it's going to help you in the long run so yeah that's but with my that tip <laughs> yeah with that tip though um i've had those tendencies that you see in a gobbler and you kill that gobbler, and then another one shows up next year in that same area, and he starts to exhibit some of those tendencies, or you expect to see those same tendencies. I've done that uh, where I've gone in after a bird and try to hunt him the same way as I hunted the last one, and he he's a, he's like Jekyll and Hyde. He's totally opposite of the other bird. He may be in that same area. So don't let that get cost you also. I mean, just because one's in that area and he's show, exhibiting those tendencies, I always like to treat them. No, well, I'm guilty of treating them the same sometimes, but I, I try to remind myself that they're all individual birds and they're unpredictable on their own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the most fascinating things about them. And, you know, I've, I've heard people say every turkey has its day, which I believe is true, right? Like every turkey has that day where he's just so fired up that he's likely to come into a call. Maybe it's weather. Maybe it has nothing to do with that, but... Every turkey has their day, but then on the other hand, there's a lot of days where they are pretty tough to get in front of, or they're going to do weird stuff. They're going to surprise you. I mean, it's like there's always those uh, little details that kind of make the story, I guess. You know, it would be so cool if there was a way to have a GPS collar on a turkey where his location wasn't revealed until after his death, and you could see, like, where all he, I mean, like, especially if a bird that lived to be seven or eight years old, 
what did he do to survive those seven or eight years? Because there's gobblers out there. I know they're old, and 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 the, and they're doing things. You know, they're not gobbling, and 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 when they have the hens, they're just drumming instead of gobbling. It'd be very fascinating. It's very fascinating to me to to want to know, you know, how they managed. Where you know, other gobblers say first first time they're uh, a long beard, they get shot. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then the other ones just survive for years and years and years. I bet that most of those times that when one makes it that long, somewhere along the lines, he had a buddy that he made a mistake with, and then he learned a lot from that mistake. (laughs) You know, not not letting that happen to me. (laughs) That's why. That's why I always tell people to shoot the looker, not the strutter. Yes, seriously. When they come in, because you shoot that strutter, the looker's already like. Like he's paranoid about something, and he's looking everywhere, and then you shoot the strutter right beside him. Now he's running out of screaming, you know, and then you you call the next day to him, and he ain't coming back. It's like no, but you shoot I, that you shoot that looker, and the strutter's like, oh, okay, and he goes, you know, he runs off or whatever. Next day he's gobbling again. You call him right in, and that yeah. that may be that may not be good advice to save the population. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, I was, that's, I was. That's always been my motto: shoot the looker, and then you'll you'll be able to call the strutter in tomorrow i was just just thinking of this when jake posted that hunt with uh his friend riley and riley's son i don't know if you watched that one yet but they're youth hunting <laughs> oh the youth hunt they're sitting right beside on that tree in the on the edge of the field yep yeah i and saw that the one turkey comes in and he's all like he's nervous from the beginning well then the shut the strutter gets shot and that other one takes off running across the field, and they're high fiving or whatever. Right. And I sent a Snapchat to my buddies and zoomed in to the turkey in the background. The other Tom running off and just said, "Like how the weirdest turkey of all time gets created." It's like that <laughs> moment right there. Like he's yeah. already nervous. Like I already don't want to come in, but this guy yeah. is. And then that guy gets shot. Now he's just like, "Okay, I'm never doing anything ever again." <laughs> <laughs> they just created that gobbler that you make one yelp and he shuts up for the rest of the day. <laughs> That's yeah, him. That's... He, that's him running away. <laughs> <laughs> that's the weirdo over there. But I think that's pretty funny. All right, dude. Well, hey, I appreciate it. I feel like we should wrap this up. Not because Yeah, it's getting it's getting close to roosting time here in another hour. I gotta get ready for that. Not because I don't want to keep talking, but yeah. you know, the more we talk, then the more I'm gonna have to edit this up, so <laughs> Yeah. You just just remember to get rid of that one part. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, I will. I totally will. I don't know what well, part I... you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it, man, and I guess uh if you want, plug your channel. Oh, yes. Uh Shane Simpson Hunting. That's that's the title everywhere. YouTube, uh website, you know, on the internet. Um I don't know. TikTok, I I guess you can type that in. I don't know if it'll take you there, but <laughs> <laughs> Just go to YouTube yeah. and, and my website, and that's good enough. ShaneSimpsonHunting.com yeah. and Shane Simpson Hunting on YouTube. You won't be disappointed. Appreciate it, Shane. Good all luck right. roosting tonight. Hope uh, that, th- thanks hope for having me on, man. Well. It was fun. Thanks for having me on. It was fun. Yeah, dude. I think it was probably a great way to wait for your buddy to get there from the airport. Well, let me know if you do any good in the morning. I'll, I'll send you a picture first thing. If all you right, get dude. one. You'll be the first one to get one. <laughs> all right. Talk to you later. Yeah, later.